Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming. Today we have a special guest. We have uh, uh, David Friedel from uh, the University of Oxford. So David is a second year PhD student. As you can see, he works also with our field. Uh, he did his master from the University of Sheffield, work on perovskites for some reason, but then he found the light, <laughs> moved to silicon. Uh, and his talk today is about uh, his characterization techniques for multicrystalline silicon. So, David, it's nice to have you here. You will be yeah. here also next week, I assume. Yeah. So, if there is more questions, David will be here also next week. So, please welcome David. Cool. Right. Thank you very much for having me. Um, I, yeah, as you said, second year, second year D for student at Oxford, and I'm not actually really a solar guy in some ways. Um, I'm a TO scientist and I'm a, and I'm a microscopist. And what really drives me is talking to you guys and seeing, so what's the main limiting factors to high efficiency solar cells um, from, from, from the solar industry and then try to sort of develop solutions for, from a microscopical point of view um, about how we can get the best possible solar cells um, yeah, possible. So, multi-crystalline silicon solar cells. So, I'm, I don't really need to convince you all that solar is great, but what's quite nice is this figure showing how much the photovoltaic industry is increasing year on year. So, I think it's gone up to around 40,000 new solar panels increased, no, installed every hour in 2017. And also, this coincides with a year-on-year -year cost reduction. And at the moment, so low-cost multi-crystalline silicon cell cells are the dominant industry technology. So although dominant, multi-crystalline silicon cell cells have around a 1% absolute efficiency lower than monocrystalline silicon. And this is due to this bulk recombination effect. And bulk recombination is caused mainly by crystallographic defects that introduce deep levels into your bang up, and therefore you get recombination, shockley reed hall recombination in these recombination active regions. And from a microscopist point of view, understanding these recombination active regions is quite a challenge. So it's, you need to analyze on the atomic scale and also very, very small levels of impurities um, at these defects can cause significant amount of recombination and affect the efficiency of your solar cell. So we need an advanced microscopy technique. So I've said areas of recombination, so what do they actually look like? So here is an EBIC image of a multicrystalline wafer, and we've got recombination active grain boundaries, we've got intragranular desiccations, and it is really these defects that are affecting, the, that you find in these recombination active regions. And as I've said, it's the small amounts of impurities, maybe transition metals, that decorate these defects and cause your recombination. So luckily, industry uses two key techniques to improve the electrical properties. So as you all know, gettering during the formation of your emitter, where you get a heating process and impurities dissolve into your bulk and segregate to a less critical region of your cell in effect cleaning up your solar cell. And then hydrogen passivation, which is the introduction of your of atomic hydrogen during the firing of your metallization. And hydrogen's released from the, in the atomic set um, atomically from your dielectric layers and it bonds to some of your crystallographic defects and reduces their recombination activity. So what are my aims? I want to characterize these defects when they've been af through the various stages of solar manufacture. So why is the combination of gettering and hydrogen passivation not always effective? So here is one of your standard PL images and we've got recombination active regions, so after phosphorus diffusion and hydrogen passivation. So we're still getting these, these dark regions here. Why is that? Why, why has that region not responded, and other regions you have very high lifetimes. And also, are there impurities and defects that are especially harmful to cell efficiencies? And in order to do this, we need a multi-scale method to provide a detailed characterization. So 
we need to look from the macro scale to the, to the micro and then down to the nano and atomic scale. So there's lots of techniques we can use. So bulk lifetime PL you do here a lot for your characterization. But then also there's micro scale techniques. So um, electron beam induced current mapping gives you sort of micron resolution of recombination activity. And then also down to the nano scale. So transmission Kikuchi diffraction gives you crystallographic information, TM, and then down to atom pro tomography, which gives you chemical and spatial information. And that's sort of the main focus of my project. So for those of you who don't know, EBIC is introduced into, is what well, is utilized and is, is used in a SEM. So you have a scanning electron beam and the beam scans across the surface and creates electron hole pairs or generates. And using a Schottky contact as your collecting junction, you can measure the, the current as the electron beam scans over. And when the electron beam scans a defect, so in this case a dislocation, you get a lower current due to recombination at the dislocation. And the difference between your background level and your, your current at the defect gives you a contrast, which is directly relatable to how much recombination is at this defect. So in order to do EBIC, you're, you need a flat surface usually, because you don't want your surf surface effects to, to influence your measurements. So the one thing that I've always done, and m most material scientists do a lot, is colloidal silica polishing, just to get a flat surface. However, when we did this colloidal silica polishing, we found that our lifetimes absolutely crushed. And also, we got very low counts in PL. And so we were a bit confused, because this is a real, really standard technique used in material science to get a flat surface. So we thought, well, we can use our EBIC, electron beam induced current, and also atom probe, and basically see what, what's, what's actually going on. So here is the same wafer, but before polishing and after polishing. And what we can see is our green boundaries after polishing have absolutely lit up. So this means they've become a much more recombination active. So, and also we're getting these intragranular dislocations that before we did not observe them in EBIC. So a clean dislocation is electrically inactive, but once they've become decorated, they've suddenly become recombination active and affect the lifetime of your solar cell. So marked here, we can see contrasts are going from sort of 1.5% to 12.9%, to so significantly increasing. And the only answer for this is we're introducing some sort of impurity from the, the colloidal silica polishing process. So how do, how do we analyze what impurities are caused um, by this polishing? We can use atom probe tomography. So atom probe uses a needle-shaped specimen of around 50 nanometers in tip radius. You cool the needle down to around 50 Kelvin to minimize surface diffusion. And then you apply a, apply a standing field and you pulse with a laser. And because you know the time of your pulse and you evaporate these atoms and ionize them, and then they travel a certain length L and hit a position sensitive detector, and since you know the time of the pulse and when they hit the detector, you can do time of flight mass spectrometry to work out what type of the, the chemical species present. And then also the use of a position sensitive detector, you can build up a three-dimensional three atom map where you have the location of the individual atoms and also its chemical identity. So here we have a green boundary um, decorated in, in nitrogen when it comes around. So this is one of my atom probe tomography date, um, measurements where I've run a needle and then analyzed what's actually at this boundary. One thing to note is you do have background, you do have um, background noise in this sample. So in the intragrain region, so in the bulk, we are getting some noise, but there's not actually nitrogen there. We have got noise in the sample. So to make this needle, which has the grain boundary running through the needle, 
is actually quite a difficult process. It takes around maybe five hours to make one needle and it's all done in a microscope. So this is only around a 15 micron um, lift out bar and I've marked it with tungsten and then put a carbon layer on to deposit from carbon layer to pre prevent damage from your gallium beam. Then you lift out this needle using a really small manipulator and you stick it onto a TM half grid where you've got the grain boundary running through the, the sample and then you polish down into this ultra sharp needle uh, where hopefully your grain boundary is running through the tip so we can analyze it in Atom Probe. So back to the closed silicon polishing. I don't know how easy it is to see, but before polishing, we see decoration of our light impurities. Uh, we've, so we've got oxygen there, we've got carbon at this grain boundary. So this is an identical grain boundary in sister wafers before polishing and after polishing. And again, we see oxygen carbons, just light elements present after polishing. So it's not these light elements that are causing this recombination, it seems. But it is actually huge amounts of nickel and copper that are diffusing in at room temperature. So here is just background noise before polishing. And then after polishing, we're getting huge decoration of our defects by room temperature diffusion of nickel and copper that diffuse down your grain boundaries and your, and your dislocations and decorate them and cause all this recombination. So to conclude, we're actually getting some clustering here as well. We get, the levels are high enough to induce clustering of nickel and copper. So this is an issue specifically in our samples. So we're only using laboratory conditions. So maybe it's a contamination from our, our sample preparation. Um, but these impurities do diffuse quickly enough at room temperature to decorate and to decorate our defects and cause recombination. So my main conclusion is don't use closed silica polishing. We need to use chemical etching because we don't want to contaminate our samples. So now down to the major study. So this is some HP multi, which is probably the main dominant material nowadays. Uh, P-type sister wafers. I've got four sister wafers from the ASCAST phosphorus diffusion getted, hydrogen passivated, and then your end of process, phosphorus diffusion getted and hydrogen passivated. This is a work in progress, so I've got another year or two where I'm going to keep working on these samples, but I can show you what I've got so far. And the first thing I did, here's some PL. So I, you guys, um, so I got the PL done here, and I looked at the most nasty region possible because I thought well it's, it's a good place to start so this is a region that limits the efficiency of your cell cell and I took it to electron backscatter diffraction so and what did I see I saw not very much um, this this it looks like you've just basically got so electron backscatter diffraction gives you grain orientation and it all looks kind of green and what this means is you've got very low grain misorientations. So you've got very, very low angle grain boundaries. And I can actually outline these boundaries a bit more clearly if I take an average of this whole green region and map the misorientation. And we're getting misorientations of less than five degrees. So they're around sort of two, three degrees misorientation. And what this means is they're low angle grain boundaries. They're there are technically edge dislocations on top of each other and that, current, that allows for your misorientation and the spacing relates to the the spacing of the dislocations relates to the, the misorientation. So I selected this area of interest for EBIC and what we can see is our before as cast sample, so before any processing uh, this grain boundary is around 3.8% contrast and then after getting we're actually getting an increase in our contrast. So this really suggests we're getting some sort of internal gettering effect um, after gettering um, because we're getting the interest increase in EBIT contrast. And now we go to Atom Pro, so I went from the macro scale, now going to the micro and then 
going to the atomic scale with Asimpro tomography. First, TM confirms there is a tilt grain boundary with these edge dislocations here. And the misorientation matches the ideal character the ideal calculation. And then when we go to Asim probe, we can see these dislocations and they're elevated in carbon. So what, what, what's happening is we're getting carbon segregated to this grain boundary. And this is for the ask as cast sample. And then when we compare the post-getted sample, again, we see levels of carbon at the boundary, but we don't detect any other transition metals. So we've actually got very similar levels of carbon before and after gettering. So what we can conclude is perhaps the levels of the transition metals that are causing the difference in the EBIT contrast are too low. So they're below the, the metal impurity detection limit for us in probe, perhaps. So around 2 to, 10, 2 to 10 ppm segregated to a particular region. Um, but so perhaps when we get all these low angle grain boundaries, impurities, there's a lot of places the impurities can go, and therefore we don't detect the transition metals. They're not above our detection limit. However, when we go to a grain boundary that is basically on its own, and we still get this increase in recombination after gettering, we can see before the gettering process, in the ASCAS sample, we've got practically zero copper at the grain boundary, whereas after gettering, we've got a significant level of copper decorating this grain boundary. So maybe copper is, the, is sort of one of the dominant impurities that is causing this increase in recombination after gettering. We're not seeing any other transition metals, so no iron or nickel at this boundary. Um, but there is one, what's interesting, there's a lack of other grain boundaries around. So perhaps the levels in this case are high enough for us to be able to detect copper at this boundary. So what about samples? So I've talked about gettering. What about samples that are finished? So they're being getted and hydrogen passivated. So when we look in the literature, um, so here's a nice Elbic map of an ungetted wafer. So you've got these recombination active grain boundaries. Then after gettering, this is what we've seen as well. So we've seen the, the, the grain boundaries become more recombination active, but your intragrain regions improve. So the internal gettering effect. And then after gettering and hydrogenation, a lot of our grain boundaries go, go away. So the vast majority actually do not become an issue for, for the solar cell after these processes. However, there's still the odd boundary. So why are some specific grain boundaries electrically active? And it seems to correlate with the type of boundary. So this is an EBSD map. And it seems like our recombination active grain boundaries respond to hydrogenation. Our sigma-3 grain boundaries tend to be electrically act inactive throughout. And then these higher coincidence angle grain boundaries and small angle grain boundaries remain generally electrically active after hydrogenation. So why is this? And I've also seen this in my samples. So I'm going to look at this region here um, in EBSD. So this is from one of the PL, one of the studies that has been samples that has been getted and hydrogen passivated. And when we do EBIC of this region, we've got recombination active well, no, we've got random angle grain boundaries that are recombination inactive after this gettering and hydrogenation process, whereas small angle grain boundaries are still recombination active. So maybe it's something to do with the chemistry after the hydrogenation and gettering process. And in the active grain boundary, the small angle grain boundary, there's more carbon, and in the compared to the inactive. And in the inactive grain boundary, we've got more nitrogen. But we're not evaluating the whole picture. In order to analyze what's actually going on compared to in, in these two boundaries that are inactive and active, we need to understand what's going on with the hydrogen. So we may be getting some nitrogen passivation of the grain boundaries, and maybe there's some transition metals at the active grain boundary. But in order for us to 
to really dig down and do microscopy of these grain boundaries after the hydrogenation process, we need to be able to understand where the hydrogen is actually going. So what the solar cell community does not know is why does A respond, A, why is A still recombination active and why does I respond to this, to this gettering, to this gettering and hydrogenation process? So is the hydrogen, does the hydrogen get repelled by the local field at the recombination active grain boundary? Does the hydrogen stay there? Um, does it, maybe there's a little lack of traps or it forms molecular hydrogen and then leaves the sample. And then what is this role of grain boundary type? So why, did, why don't all grain boundaries respond equally to the, the hydrogenation process? And what we need is a method that allows for an unambiguous detection of hydrogen at specific defects that we choose. So here is a method that I've sort of developed and it uses atomic hydrogen but in the form of deuterium. So unfortunately in atom probe we get a background level of not like 1H, so hydrogen in our chamber through, through ambient hydrogen and therefore we need to use isotopic doping in the form of deuterium to actually be able to observe where hydrogen's going. So I use remote plasma um, deuteration, so around 200 degrees for 60 minutes. And if, since we use remote plasma, we can actually introduce our deuterium in the atomic, atomically, which is much more effective than introducing deuterium molecularly. molecularly. And it more closely replicates how uh, our sample is, how, well, how hydrogen is introduced industrially. So when we fire our dielectric layers, we introduce our deuterium in the atomic, um, in the atomic sense. So the first thing I selected after I've done this remote plasma deuteration was a random angle grain boundary. So these are grain boundaries that usually respond to the hydrogen passivation process. And I selected a needle from, from this sample and created a needle for atom probe, as I've talked about previously. Before atom probe, we did TEM, just to confirm that the needle is in the tip before analysis. And then also transmission Kikuchi diffraction allows the misorientation and the rotation axis of the grain boundary to be determined. So you can see we've got around 50 degrees misorientation and a rotation axis as specified there. And when we go to atom probe, we can observe deuterium unambiguously at this grain boundary. So the, the reason why I'm saying unambiguously is because we're detecting deuterium at four Daltons, so in the form of 2H2+. And there's no overlap. So often one of these big problems with mass spectrum, uh, mass, like time of flight mass spec, is we get overlaps between different atoms. And in this case, we don't see any peak at four Dalton before the deuteration of a random angle grain boundary. And then after we do the deuteration, we observe this, this increase of deuterium at the grain boundary. However, the vast majority of deuterium is observed as a silicon hydrogen complex present at 30, 31, 32 Dalton. So you can see there's hugely more um, deuterium at this boundary after in, in this silicon complex. And we need to use a deconvolution to determine and quantify how much deuterium is at this boundary. But we need to deconvolute between different, um, different use, we're using the silicon peak heights, so the relative peak heights and the silicon natural abundance. We also studied a sigma three grain boundary. So here is a grain boundary in a forward scattered image before, um, before we went to Arsene probe. And we can see this is just background noise in deuterium and we didn't observe any impurities, either transition metals or in deuterium at this boundary. Additionally, so three dislocations were observed 
decorated in deuterium. So desiccations are of concern to solar cell manufacturers um, regarding their passivation. And we've actually observed that we, you do get a passivation effect from deuterium being introduced and they do decorate these individual desiccations in, in both, and can be detected in both four Daltons and then also in the silicon deuterium complex. So I've said deconvolution, so how do we quantify so how much deuterium are at these defects? So one of the big features of our method is we can compare between different grain boundaries and how much deuterium is there and then perhaps in the future correlate that to the recombination activity of the grain boundaries. And we do deconvolution by looking at, the, looking at our mass spectra and trying to determine how much deuterium is present in the different peaks. So we first look at the four Dalton peak. So this is our unambiguous peak. And we can see that with the deuterated random angle grain boundary, we only have the, the, the peak at four Daltons and we do not observe it in the random angle grain boundary that hasn't been exposed to deuterium. Then we look at our 31 and 32 peaks. So these are minor peaks of the silicon main peak. And you can see they're much bigger in the deuterated sample because of the contribution from the silicon deuterium complex. But the majority of our deuterium detected is at this 30 Dalton peak. So these blue lines are the natural abundance. And you can see there's a slight increase in our 29 peak. And that is due to silicon and ambient hydrogen. And then in the deuterated, we've got a significantly more, um, significantly higher quantity of counts at this, at this peak. And that is due to a silicon deuterium um, complex that is um, increasing the peak height above the natural abundance. So by extracting a region of interest, which contains either these grain boundaries or these desiccations shown here, we can start to quantify and also put an error, error value on in a 95% confidence interval on these, um, on these different defects and trying to quantify how much deuterium are at these defects. And to give you sort of a general idea of the amount of deuterium atoms per atomic site in the defect, for the random angle grain boundary, it's around 0.2, but for the dislocations, we're getting five, and then in the third dislocation, we're getting significantly more, up to eight atom atomic deuterium atoms per atomic site in the defect. So this means that not only the deuterium atoms decorating the core of the dislocation, but there's also a cultural atmosphere around the dislocation in which the deuterium atoms have segregated to and, uh, and are decorating. So in general, to summarize, uh, we have developed a method that allows for the mapping of hydrogen at defects um, in multicrystalline silicon. And we can really use this technique to try and start to gain an understanding of why some defects respond and some defects don't respond to our passivation process. And perhaps that might really revolutionize and also um, encourage a new field in which people um, study hydrogen in a closer detail and can actually directly observe and compare between defects after this hydrogen passivation process. Uh, we introduce deuterium atomically, so ideally we'd want to make deuterated nitrides and then we can directly re replicate what they do in industry. And I think there's, there's definitely work going on to form these deuterated nitrides. But the, since we introduce it atomically, we can get high levels and we can actually detect it in significant quantities at the different defects. And then we can also quantify how much deuterium is present at the individual defect using our deconvolution process. So the next steps are we need to correlate to electrical activity. So that could be using PL or what we have at Oxford, we can do EBIC and we can study these grain boundaries before and after this passivation process. And then we can hopefully finally understand why some, de some boundaries respond and why some don't. So is it the hydrogen is there? Is the hydrogen actually there at these boundaries that didn't respond to the passivation process?
So then sort of wrapping up some general acknowledgements from Manchester, Warwick and UNSW. And then thank you very much for listening to my talk. Last talk. So, when you actually, um, so you do EBIT to identify what the grain boundary is, yeah. um, but when you come to do your cutout for your TEM, you've got a layer of tungsten, was it tungsten over there? So, yeah, so I do a chemical etch that lines the boundaries, so a seco etch that outlines the grain boundaries. Then, in order to be able to see where the boundaries are when I'm making my needles, um, I, dec I use a line of tungsten on top of the sample and therefore, but I polish the tungsten away eventually for the, the, end, for the tip at the end. Okay, so you can see the etched away line. So yeah, so you, and then you polish into your sample and therefore that, that region is actually removed. And then you use a low um, energy cleaning step after just to, um, to, to try and reduce the amount of gallium in your tip. So you have to remove the tungsten before you do your TEM? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Another question? Jay, I knew that you would ask question. <laughs> do you have any idea, you said that you're doing gallium uh, fib yeah. and any contamination issue with the fib on, in terms of gallium? So yeah, so one of the good things about Atom Probe compared to TEM is we can actually see if we've got lots of gallium contamination. So you can actually detect the gallium in Atom Probe. And what you usually see is a small amount of gallium at the very surface when you start to take your measurements. And then, providing you've made a good needle, the, the gallium goes to sub um, below background levels um, further down the needle. So hopefully, the contamination is all removed in the, in the, the start of your run. And you don't use that region for your analysis. Okay. Um, I've just just a question about your great talk, by the way, David. Thank you. Um, a question about your your units that you have, the Daltons. So uh, that's, yes. That's the mass to charge ratio. Yes. Um, so it's did you say that it's the same for your silicon hydrogen complex and the silicon deuterium complex? Uh, so there's an overlap. So the the major peak um, of silicon is 28. So this is a log scale. So around 95 percent is in your 28 peak. So the major hydrogen com silicon hydrogen complexes are at 29 Dalton for silicon with your ambient hydrogen. And then your deuterium will be at 30 Dalton. And that's, um, that's, how, that's the majority of the deuterium detected in our sample. So they do, they do have a difference. So there is an overlap. So, but luckily we have, sort of, we have um, five peaks here and only four unknown. So we've got O2, SIH, SID, and we assume that this 28 peak is all silicon. And therefore, we can do a deconvolution and fit how much of each of these elements are present. Um, so with your atomic probe results, you seem to have these like 3D maps. Yes. Like, how accurate are the positions from you get from those? <laughs> <laughs> Depends. So um, you do a reconstruction, and in this reconstruction, you can model the shape of your tip using a, a couple of different techniques. And what I use is the how the voltage increases throughout the run determines the size of your needle. And so you can build it up quite accurately, and you can also use poles in your in your data to try and help with your reconstruction. But people say that you can go maybe, uh, it's hard to put a number on, maybe 0.5 nanometers resolution, about spatial resolution. It depends on the, on the reconstruction. But you can accurately see desiccations as 2D defects. So they're, they're, it's, pretty, it's pretty good. Thank you.